Hey guys, I don't know if you can tell by my clothes here, but I'm a little bit on a uh, a flip video bender today. <laughs> so I thought I should you know, mix things up a little bit so you don't get bored. I think I look pretty good in these. This discussion goes with this handout. It's all about religion and reform in the early 19th century. Okay? So, this is actually serious, so let me take these off. But, this is all about the next goal, where we are really coming to our own as a nation. We're kind of like an adolescent. And when you're in your adolescence, you start kind of questioning yourself, and what do I really believe, and what do I really stand for, and what should I look like, and do I like how I look, or do I not like how I look, and all those kinds of things, like am I cool, or am I not cool? And that's kind of what the United States starts going through during this time period. It's a really intense period of reform and reflection and kind of questioning ourselves and our nation and if we're living up to our ideals and those kinds of things. So it's really neat. We're going to start by talking about religion. We're going to be talking about art and literature. And then we're going to talk about um, social movements related to different populations as well. So there's a lot going on here. Probably about 20 minutes if I'm good. But let's head on to the PowerPoint here. All right, so... The first thing that goes on is religion, uh, religious movements. Oh, I forgot to tell you this part. Okay, so anyway, we're a really interesting country, a really interesting culture. Most, um, the country was founded on a Judeo-Christian tradition, and everyone in that tradition believes that you only get one life, unlike, say, Hinduism or Buddhism, where they believe you have hundreds of lives. So we're not at all cavalier about your one life you get. I mean, it wouldn't be right if in your one life that you had something really unjust happen to you. We kind of have this idea that everyone, since they only have one life and life is very precious, that everyone ought to have like a fair experience. So we don't we don't stand um, we don't handle uh, like bad stuff very well. Our country doesn't have a lot of tolerance for evil or a lot of tolerance for injustice. We think we got to fix it to make it fair. Okay, a lot of other cu cultures look at our culture and are like this silly Americans are so cute they think they're like going to conquer poverty or like make sure that everything is fair and just. And they think that's kind of laughable because in their religion, they think that evil is just a part of the world and your whole job is to get free of the world. But we think that the world should be a reflection of God's creation. So as a result, we try and make a more perfect union, a more perfect society. Okay, And that comes out of our religious fervor. And that's why our, our society is so... Um, so progressive and constantly evolving and questioning ourselves and reforming itself. Um, we are busy trying to make ourselves the very best society and the fairest society that we can be. And so I can't underestimate the importance of our religion, um, religion in America, as the crux of that. So there's a huge religious movement during this time period called the Second Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening was, oh, in the 1700s, actually, oh gosh, before that, around 1700. Um, and it was all about the Puritans. But now what we're starting to understand is that in the late 1700s, early 1800s, we're starting to understand a couple new things about religion. One is we start to reject the idea of predestination. Okay, Predestination is the idea that um, God is all-knowing, and so he knows whether you're going to be saved and go to the great sorority and the fraternity in the sky or if you're damned to hell. And there's not really a whole lot you're going to be able to do about it. It's almost like God created... Uh, these little robots, and you're just running through the motions. You're just kind of unwinding the game. Um, but that, that, that there's not a lot of hope that you're actually going to change the game. Okay? And uh, this leads people to be kind of fatalistic. And if anything, they would, you would think that they would just go wild, right? Because they can't control their destiny. But actually, the Puritans are very um, kind of obsessed with trying to appear like they're one of the chosen, and they live very um, strict lifestyles and, um, and the ideas that you would be uh, you'd be wealthy because, of course, if you're one of the chosen, you're going to be productive and a hard worker and those things. Well, what they decide in this time period, which is really kind of amazing, is they decide, no, that's wrong. <laughs> Actually, um, you do control your destiny. It's up to you to do something to be saved. Now, what that something is, not all the different denominations that form during this time period agree. Okay, But there's something you have to do to be saved, and it's up to you, the individual. Okay, You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, or you have to do certain deeds or whatever, they're still kind of in not, they're not in all agreement about what it is you have to do, but the idea is that it is up to you and you have to do something. So there's this real sense on like individual behavior and the fact that what you in fact choose for yourself, it does have a lasting impact from now into the hereafter. Okay? Ooh, I do go on, don't I? All right, gotta... 
I'll shorten that up. Okay, so um, they reject predestination and Calvinism, and they put faith in individual action that people are going to uh, provide for their own salvation through those actions. And there's different flavors of this Second Great Awakening. The first one is the revivalist movement. It is, here's some pictures of it. You see this man on a stump, and he's kind of preaching. Ooh, that's kind of small. He's kind of preaching out to the masses who are gathered around him. And here's another example of a painting from the time period where you see this huge crowd gathering. And yet another one. And here, I don't know if you can see this, but there's actually people like laying on the floor and kind of in convulsions. And that tells you something about the revivalists. They believe, whoo, that's a scary guy, isn't it? I'll tell you who he is later. But don't have nightmares. It's going to be okay. Um, they have very emotional preaching, and they think that you're going to get converted in an instant. Like, you're going to get saved. You're going to be born again in a moment, okay? And it's usually at one of these big revivals um, that last over several days, and people would, like, sleep in the fields. Uh, they usually be in summertime. Um, they would sleep in the fields and, and gather each evening to hear uh, a continuing, kind of evolving and intense, intensifying message. Um, this guy, Charles G. Finney, was the most famous preacher during this time period, and he brought a lot of people to um, salvation through this revivalist strand. If any of you have had any experience in your churches or with revivals, you know that they still kind of follow this idea. You have a guest preacher. Uh, they last over several days. They're typically in the summer. So even in uh, some of the denominations here in the South, we still see this tradition at some level. Okay? The next group of people in religion were the Unitarians. And so we're moving on down here, right? We just talked about Great Awakening, Revivalism, Unitarians. The Unitarians, uh, they didn't believe in revivalism. They criticized these, like, emotional revivals and said that they were not authentic and they weren't going to be long-lasting. And they appeal to reason. They think that you can get people to, to understand their faith better through reason and study. And that if you look at nature, heck, you look at your hand. Your hand, it's an amazing thing, like, really. It, it had, they, they would get into this idea of intelligent design, I think, the idea that things do not happen just by happenstance. And so if you appeal to reason, you can still find a way to believe in a supreme being. And that's what they did. They thought that you got converted over your whole lifetime, that you were any instant conversion was suspect and not likely to last. And so they thought conversion was a gradual process. Their most famous preacher was Ellery, Ellery Channing. And the denominations today that still tend to be from this perspective tend to be, they tend to have very learned clergy, they have like a doctorate in theology, um, they don't do a lot of dancing or clapping or emotion, no charism charismatic um, uh, stuff going on in their services, they're kind of better homes and gardens, neat and tidy in their practices, in their um, religion. Okay, so today you still see in our churches this kind of division between charismatic Pentecostal kind of approach towards faith and then this more reasonable and, and learned approach. Then you get the AME church. I always saw these down south when I was a kid growing up and I had no idea what it stood for and now you will. It stands for African Methodist Episcopal. So the fact that it has African in the name should indicate to you that they were mainly black churches. And only churches in the north um, were allowed to be all black, because in the South, slave masters did not allow their slaves to have their own churches. Um, it wouldn't surprise you that the uh, black churches in the North are against slavery, and they want to do more to stop the spread of slavery. And since um, blacks aren't really given a lot of opportunity to lead and hold leadership positions in other institutions in the North, like white-owned businesses or um, they don't become managers or they're not elected to government of office or those kinds of things. It really becomes the one institution in their lives where they have complete control of it. And um, so church really becomes this, the center of their world, socially as well as religiously. Their most famous pre preacher is a guy named Richard Allen. Uh, Richard Allen established the AME Church once the, uh, they used to go to the Episcopal Church that the white people went to. But the white people in the north increasingly started segregating them, and so there was kind of a walkout. Now, I've told you there aren't black churches in the South, and the question is, well, why not? There's a lot of black people in the South, slaves, of course. Um, why wouldn't they have their own churches? And the answer is that, oh, it's not on the slide. The answer is that uh, the slave masters, particularly after Nat Turner's Rebellion, which we're about to talk about, they're increasingly worried that if the slaves start studying the Bible, they might study parts of it that are um, liberating, like Exodus. The book of Exodus is all about this, the slaves of Israel freeing themselves from their masters in Egypt. So they start wanting to really carefully control what the slaves learn from the Bible, and they want them to study things like the meek shall inherit the earth and toil here on earth for your reward is in heaven kind of ideas. 
And so they make them go to the white churches and sit in segregated seating in the balconies if they can go to church at all. Okay? All right, so we start seeing um, some changes in literature and art as well during this time period. One huge movement is called transcendentalism. Big, big word. Transcendentalists are writers and thinkers who are committed to the idea that nature is kind of like God's map for humanity. And if you spend a lot of time studying nature and its processes and its seasons, that you'll find out a lot about the Creator. Um, they also think that you don't need the clergy to have a relationship with God. They basically think you can talk to God directly and that you can kind of have even a church of one. You can worship by yourself. You can worship and read the Bible yourself. That um, They're kind of anti-establishment. They think that the clergy has gotten too powerful and um, that you need to have more of your own personal relationship with God. Okay. Um, their leaders are Ralph Waldo Emerson. That's this guy right here. And Henry, da oh, I'm sorry, this is Henry David Thoreau, and this is Ralph Waldo Emerson. And at some point, um, they're kind of like hippies without the drugs and the rock and roll. And that they really think you ought to think for yourself. Like, I think that they're the ones, if they had a bumper sticker that's around today, it would be the question authority bumper sticker, okay? Because they really thought you should question authority. An example of that is that Henry David Thoreau goes and lives at this pond for two years all by himself in total solitude. And um, it's called Walden. I, a rumor has it his mom did his laundry, so I don't know if really he should get the props that he gets. But at any rate, that just kind of shows how um, free of a thinker he was. He really wanted to separate himself from society and commune with nature himself. There's also a famous story about Henry David Thoreau related to, um, it won't surprise you probably, that uh, the transcendentalists are against slavery. And uh, later we're going to study the Mexican War, which is, could spread slavery um, throughout, uh, add more slave states to the United States. So Henry David Thoreau is, of, of course, against the Mexican War, and he figures, well, if you're against something, the best way to be against it is not to pay your taxes, because your taxes are going to support the military who's going to fight the war and expand slavery. So he just quit paying his taxes. Kind of rebellious. This is his idea of civil disobedience. You break laws that you disagree with as a means of protest. Now, of course, when that happens, you get arrested, and that's what happened to Henry David Thoreau. He went to jail. And a really good story is that um, one time, during this time period, Henry David Thoreau is in jail, and Ralph Waldo Emerson hears about it, and he goes running to the jail. And, you know, of course, there's that little window with the bars that you can look in. And he says, Henry David, what are you doing in there? And Henry David jumps up, and he runs to the window, and he says, Ralph Waldo, what are you doing out there? Okay, the idea is that all just people should be not paying their taxes, and they should all be in jail. And if you fill the jails up, they can't enforce the law anymore, and they'll have to change the law. So that's the whole idea behind civil disobedience, and that story helps bring that to light. It's going to inspire people like Martin Luther King later, who is also going to break laws that he considers to be um, unjust. Okay, so no extra charge for that cute little story. All right, next slide concerns romanticism in literature. Okay, romanticism. When you hear romanticism, hopefully you're studying this in English 11. Do not think like, mm, kissy, kissy, I love you so much. No, that is not what romanticism is. Romanticism is, um, let me just give you some examples of some romantic works and see if any of them strike um, a chord. Frankenstein, romantic novel by Mary Shelley in Britain. It's about putting dead people's body parts together and making a monster that like gets struck by lightning. This is like the legend of Sleepy Hollow, where there's this guy who haunts this road, and he has a pump, he's lost his head, and he has a pumpkin on his head, and he terrorizes people. Or this is, um, this is by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This is by Edgar Allan Poe. It's the Telltale Heart. Bet you read this in middle school. It's about this guy who killed this other guy, and he uh, buried him under the floorboards, and now he hears his heart beating, and it drives him insane. All of those are examples of romanticism. So none of those are love stories, right? None of them are sweet romantic comedies, that's for sure. Because... In literature, um, romanticism focuses on abstract essences, things like the supernatural, feelings, things you can't see but you feel, um, ghosts, goblins, um, things you can't explain. Okay, all of that's part of romantic literature. Also, emotionalism, people's feelings. Um, uh, those kinds of things, not reason, not, not abs more abstract stuff, not more reason or concrete stuff. So here's some more examples. So Hawthorne's The Birthmark. I don't know if you remember uh, reading, if you've ever heard of Nathaniel Hawthorne, he wrote the, uh, the Scarlet Letter. 
But um, the Scarlet Letter, um, you know, that movie, Easy A, right? So maybe that'll help you. Um, the Scarlet Letter, Hester Prynne, um, she's been impregnated by someone in her community, and therefore they consider her to be an adulterer, and so she has to wear the Scarlet Letter on her, on her clothing. And then we find out that the young preacher in town, sorry, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, uh, the young preacher in town is actually the one who produced her child, Pearl. And um, at the end of the, the book, he reveals, he rips off his uh, cloak, and it reveals that an A has been burned on his chest, too, but you don't know who did it. Like, did God do it in retribution? Did he do it to himself? Like, what happened? Who knows? So that's the whole idea behind romanticism, that everything can't be explained. Everything isn't scientific. That there's a whole other part of reality that we can never know or truly understand, and we have to be okay with that. That's what romantic literature is about. Okay? So Edgar Allan Poe, famous American romantic author from the time period, scary stories, you know, good, good Halloween stuff, basically. Okay? So that was how romanticism worked out in literature. Now in painting, we have some Hudson River School artists, and we're going to talk more about this in class. We're going to do a lot with this. Okay? But basically, these are artists who paint natural scenes of sweeping landscapes. And if there are human beings in the picture, they're always small. So Hudson River School um, artists, oh, by, by the way, they're not school, like they all went to the same school. They're like school like fish, like they all paint alike. So they're like a school of fish. They all paint alike uh, together as a group. And they all paint around New York, around the Hudson River and the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks are the mountain range there. So sweeping natural landscapes, small humans, and we'll be focusing a lot more on that later. Okay? Next we have social reform 